Tomorrow is a celebration. It's really a somber celebration. We call it Memorial Day. My parents always called it Decoration Day because it was when you went to decorate the family graves and to remember their lives. You say, where in the world did that get started? It got started a few days after the armistice or the surrender of Robert E. Lee when a group of women in Vicksburg, Mississippi went to gather together and decorate the graves of those men who had fallen in the Battle of Vicksburg. You know, it's a time when we come to look back at life and we celebrate Gettysburg and Normandy and Iwo Jima and Korea and Vietnam and Afghanistan and Iraq to honor those men and women who shed their blood, that we can be here today and enjoy the freedoms that the U.S. has to provide. You know, when I think about that, I have to share some, another perspective. I've been working on, on a song with a friend, and we've been kind of trading ideas. And I began to look back at Brazil, Indiana over the years. And I began to look at people who walked through my life as a child and even as an adult. And as a kid, I wondered what made them different. And I began to discover their stories. Now, there's some uh, old-time Brazil people here. How many people remember Goog Black? Every kid was afraid of Goog Black. He had a beard down to here. He pushed a bicycle, and he carried a gun in his bicycle. And he walked around Brazil. See you know what Goog's story is? I began to think about him, and somebody says, he came home from World War I and was never the same again. I think about my, one of my dad's childhood friends, Pete, and this is what got me started about writing a song about post-traumatic stress syndrome. I can remember Pete's wife telling me, my dad's, one of my dad's lifelong friends, Mark, you don't know what it's like to be married to the town drunk. He was a fantastic carpenter. He could build cabinets. He could do all kinds of things. But we don't know what he experienced during World War II that totally changed his life. Another person comes to mind. Most people don't know Joe. Joe lived on South Chicago Avenue, about a half mile from here. Joe was immaculately dressed. I can remember delivering their paper. He always wore a white shirt dark pants, and wingtip shoes. In the wintertime, he always wore a dress hat and a long trench coat. And it's just been the last few months, I asked a cousin, I said, can you tell me about Uncle Joe? I remember him, he always treated me well, but never hardly talked. He says, well, Uncle Joe spent two years in a North Korean prison camp during the Korean War. It was never the same. You see, we honor those people for who they've done and what they've done in in our lives to make our country better, to make it great. You know, I've had the opportunity to visit the wall on two occasions. And when I go to the wall, I go look for our neighborhood kids. I've went twice now, and both times I've looked for a guy three years older than myself that treated me so good. I was always the shortest little guy in school. I did not break five feet tall till I was in high school. And Johnny Young lived about two blocks east of the church here. But he always treated me so good. And one of our other neighbor kids from right across the alley from us, named Gary Boyce, I always go see their name on the wall. Because I appreciate what they did for me as a kid, but more importantly, what they did for me as an American to get to enjoy what I do today because they put their life on hold. We honor our heroes and we honor those of our past, but Memorial Day is all about remembering. It's all about remembering. And yet we forget Remember 9-11, all the patriotism and all the spiritual revival only 20 years ago? Where's that today? 
That's why we have days like Memorial Day set aside to cause us to reflect and remember. Now here in Brazil, we have all kinds of things around us to help us commemorate important people and special things in our community. I can remember, I couldn't find a picture of this, but when you went in the Brazil high school gymnasium, as you walked up the stairs, at the top of the stairs, can anybody remember whose picture was there? Ivan Fuquay from Brazil, Indiana, who went to the 1932 Olympics. And this large picture was there to commemorate him. But let's not walk around Brazil. If you go to the park, you're going to see this fountain. You'll say, where does that come from? That's from our sister city in South America. If you go to the city hall, you'll see the Charles B. Hall Memorial. I never knew about him. I would have been elated to know as a history student in Brazil junior high school that the first African-American to shoot down a German aircraft as part of the Tuskegee Airmen was from Brazil, Indiana. I never learned that till it came out several years ago when they did this memorial, but we honor his accomplishment. And you go in that Clay County Museum, there's all kinds of things to bring back memories of the past. You go to Bicentennial Park, or you go to Roy Brand Field. Mr. Brand was always at the old ballpark when I was a kid. We have streets that are named after people in our community, so we don't forget them, like Jesse Pitts or George Washington, the president. Here's one that most people overlook when you see it every day. As you drive past Grace Chapel out here, if you look, there's two crosses there. And you say, what do those two crosses commemorate? They commemorate Mr. and Mrs. Leibarger, who were killed by a drunk driver there. And their son faithfully makes sure that they're maintained. And that's been years and years ago. You go up to the Craig Park, and there you see our Veterans Memorial there. I go back, and I remember the little blue building that sat next to the courthouse as a kid. The one that didn't make the slideshow today, I must have dropped it out, was the new Brazil High School Memorial that's covered in plywood. I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's there to commemorate the school that's set at the corner by the Y. You know, you and I have books and scrapbooks and videos and all kinds of things to help us remember people and events from the past. And it's so important to do that. The average person's story passes after two generations. In other words, your grandpa or grandma's story, your story, will only go two generations since it's forgotten. So it's important to share those stories among your family because there are people in our past that need to be remembered for what they did. Now, we're so quick to forget. We're so quick to forget. That's why monuments are important. That's why memorials are important. That's why coming to church is important. Because each Sunday, you get an opportunity to remember and reflect and look at what God has done in your life. How much we owe God. Every Sunday is kind of a memorial day. And when you talk about remembering that word remember appears about 150 times in the scriptures. Because God knew what would happen. If you read the Old Testament, it seems like God does something good and his people come back to him. And then you look a few chapters later and they're back in the pits again. They needed to be constantly reminded of what God was doing. So in the same way today, remembering is essential to our lives. So first of all, we need to remember where we've been. Now, when we talk about remembering, it seems like most of us have spiritual dementia, don't we? We just kind of get busy with life. We get busy with our kids. We get busy with our careers. We get busy with all these things and we kind of forget God. You know, all of us 
have what I call an Ebenezer moment. A moment of divine assistance. And those of folks who come to first service, we often sing about the fount and how we have an Ebenezer. And people are probably thinking, what does that term mean? An Ebenezer is when we have divine assistance. The sign says, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help. We all have Ebenezer moments. So let's go back and see where that term. It says, afterwards, Samuel took a stone and set it upright between Mizpah and Shin. He named it Ebenezer, explaining the Lord has helped us to this point. And as we read that scripture, it's a remembrance of what God has done. And this story goes back to the Philistines. That it's a point where God's people went into battle and God gave them a miraculous victory. And so Samuel the prophet comes out and he says, let's set up a stone of remembrance here so that people will remember this place. It says he called it Ebenezer or God has delivered me. And we all have those moments in our lives. Those aha moments where when you know God stepped in and God did something beyond the ordinary in your life. I think about that. I remember one day I was at Union Hospital. I've been a law enforcement chaplain for 31 years now. And my pager went off, so I called the state police post. This is before cell phones. So I'm on the pay phone at Union Hospital. And I'm talking to the officer in charge. And he says, Mark, you don't need to come. So we got it pretty well taken care of. I said, well, I'm only about 10 minutes away. So I went ahead and did my hospital visits. And it just didn't get off my heart. It just didn't leave me, I thought. So I went out to the clergy spot, got in my car. I got on Highway 63 and made it to the vermilion Vigo County line. Walked up, and the officer in charge was there. It was just being handed a man's wallet. As he opened the wallet... There was a driver's license and picture of some kids who, dad, who had been in my youth group. I listened to that still small voice and was put in a position to do something in their life just by showing up at their house and encouraging them. You know, we can learn from those moments. I go back to a few years ago when one Sunday we had a baptism Sunday at Union Church. And I thought maybe four or five people would show up who'd been thinking about making that commitment to Christ, never made it. And over 40 people showed up that day. You know, those moments that we have, those Ebenezer moments, all of us have them where God stepped in and God did something good in our life. If you're not seeing them, you need to start looking for them. Because they're going to show up. He's going to show up. And when we get in a time of trouble, we can go back to those remembrance and reestablish our walk with God. You know, when we're struggling, it's kind of like stepping into deep water and you start to sink. And finally you hit the bottom and you push yourself back up. That's what those moments are like when God steps in and God does his part in your life and mine. Now we're going to take a look at the Israelites how they did it. In Joshua chapter 4, it says, The whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan. The Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you're going to stay tonight. So Joshua called together, the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of your Lord into the middle of Jordan. And each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you in the future. When your children ask, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. 
when it crossed Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. What an interesting story. The river stopped flowing when the priest walked into it with the Ark of the Covenant. And while the whole nation of Israel, over a million strong, crossed over, the waters just stopped. Joshua says, go out there and pick up 12 stones. They must have been good-sized stones because it said, put them on your shoulder. Bring them up here. And they built an altar, a memorial there. So that when your kids say, this is what God did. You know, we all have those stones in our lives. Sometimes we forget about them. But we really need to focus on knowing those moments when we feel the presence of God. For you, it might have been a revival or a CIY event or a church camp, a healing, a baptism. Maybe being delivered from a tragic accident that could have happened. They happen to all of us. But what that remembering helps us do is it brings us back to a point where God was real and our faith was strong. And they affirm our stability, not in ourselves, but what God can do with and through us. So remembering the past is important. So is also remembering where you are today. Joshua told him again in another chapter, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's amazing how our choices make a difference in our lives. Recently, I interacted with two families whose the men of the family both worked at the same job at the same place, the same length of time. And as I went to one person's house, it was very meager. It was nice, but there was nothing special about it. It was in a poor neighborhood. You know, just a lot of things. It wasn't the most ideal situation. And a few weeks later, I had an opportunity to go to a house of someone else who lived, worked the same job. And they lived very, very well. And I thought, it all comes down to choices in your life. When you think about choices, you think about the thief on the cross. And they say, oh, you'll be with me in paradise today. But the other thief had the same choice. And he cursed God. How you live your life depends on one essential thing. How you're living it today, that's your faith in Christ. In Romans chapter 12, here's the key to it. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That's your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing, and perfect will. It's a choice that you and I make to live by the values that this book lays out for us. It's a choice that goes against our world in a lot of ways today. It goes about how you live and how you look at life by the transformation of our mind and transforming our thinking into realizing that we are people who God wants His good will to fall flow through our lives. I can tell you what, if you live that way, you're going to stand out in our world today. You know, the problems of our world are all about choices. We've seen that this week. Choices to follow God or to follow evil. 
People living without God in their lives, they wander aimlessly with no spiritual compass. We live in a world where families are in shambles, where there's no positive male role models, where people have mixed up relationships. I can remember Wilma coming home from teaching school and talking about how some of the kids had a different man in the house every month or so. You wonder how those kids turned out. Because you are here today, you have an opportunity to live out and show an example to the world that someone and something is better than everything else out there. And what we all have to look at is that we're here not by anything we've done, but by the grace of Jesus Christ. Remember where you're at today because of what Christ has done and is doing in your life. But the third thing I want to share with you is remember you have a future. You have a future in life. Jesus says, lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age. Paul, also, Paul wrote, I can face the future because I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. To live is Christ and to die is gain. A totally different mindset than the world. You know, I do probably 20 to 30 funerals a year. And I can tell you, there's a difference between families of faith and families who have no faith. There's a difference there about what's going on and how people act and react. You know, we as Christians have a different view. Billy Graham says, someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? I shall be more alive than I am now. I have just changed my address. I've gone into the presence of God. There's a four-letter word. And if you've been to a funeral, I'm going to share a few of my closing funeral remarks. You might have heard me say some of these things. A four-letter word that changes the whole perspective of the future. And that four-letter word is H-O-P-E. That's hope. You say, how can you deal with hope in a situation like that? And I go back, I tell some stories. I tell about... David, when he had a child that was sick. And for days he prayed that that child would be healed. And eventually that child died. He hadn't eaten, he hadn't slept for days. He was exhausted emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And he sensed that something was wrong. And he came out, boy, he was blunt with his servants. He says, the child's dead, isn't he? They said, yes. He said, bring me water that I might bathe, the clean robe that I might put on, and kill the fatted calf that I might eat. And they were kind of taken back, and they said, why the change? He says, while the child was alive, I begged that he might survive, is basically. But he says some words that are so filled with hope. He says, he cannot come to me, but I can go to him. Wow. That's hope, isn't it? One of the things that happens a lot of times at funerals is when you finish the graveside service, people spread out. They're going to grandma and grandpa's grave. They're just kind of going around and they're telling their family stories. And I remember a lady named Lucille and I did her mother's funeral and we were in Rockville, Indiana. And she says, this is where uncle so-and-so says, this is my brother's grave, but his body isn't here. I looked down and it said, Lieutenant Homer Arnold, Jr., United States Army Air Force, 1921, August 1944. I became intrigued with that. In fact, I did a, when we had the TV show at Union Christian Church, I did a whole program on, on Junior. I went to the Rockville Library and this lady, who was an older lady, was there in her late 80s at that time. And she says, oh, I remember him. Every girl wanted to go out with him. He was smart. He was athletic. In fact, he was a medical student at Indiana University. And he dropped out to 
become a navigator on a B-24 Liberator. On their very first mission out of Italy, along the French-German border, their plane was shot down and he died. And his parents, their only son, they were people of faith, but yet they were devastated. They had this dream of bringing Junior home. And they kept trying to work it out, trying to work it out, and they just couldn't do. So they went out to their family grave plot, and they put Junior Stone there. And they knew because of his faith in Jesus Christ and their faith in Jesus Christ, they had hope of seeing him again. You see, hope in a Savior that raised, was raised from the grave gives us a hope that goes beyond this world. It's called a living hope in First Peter. And that sets it apart. In closing, I share a story I ran across. I can't tell you where I ran across it. One of the books I've read the last year. A young man had a summer job. He came home from college. In this particular year, he got a job on a fishing boat on the East Coast. And they'd been working a few weeks, and finally the captain had a little faith in him, and he says, hey, it was like in the middle of the night, they were going out to the fishing grounds to be there first thing in the morning. He says, I'm tired, I'm going to lay down and take a nap. He says, see this mark on the compass? You make sure the compass and that mark line up. So the fellow went down below. And as the sun began to came up, come up, the young man saw land. And he knew he shouldn't see land. He should be 100 miles out in the ocean. And he runs down and gets the captain. He says, Captain, come up here. And the captain looked down and says, it's pointed in the right direction. But we're going close to land. It can't be right. This was in the 60s before we had aluminum cans. The young man had went to eat his lunch during the middle of the night and set his steel pop can down right next to the compass. And he got them totally off course. When they removed the compass, it righted itself, showed them which direction to go. Maybe you're in that position today because remembering can keep us on course. Remembering our past, where we've been and what God's done. Remembering where we're at today and where we're going in the future. But it can also help you and I make the corrections we need to make in our life. To stay on a life that honors God and brings glory to Him. See, remembering is important. We remember those people who serve to keep us free. But when we remember what Christ has done in and through our lives, it makes a difference. That's my prayer today for you. That you look back, you look at today and you look at the future, and you see what God is doing and wants to do in your life. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for a hope that you place within my heart and in my life. A hope that allows me to look beyond this world and see what you want to do. And I know there's other folks that are kind of off course out here maybe today. And it's their opportunity to get back on course. Maybe someone who's never trusted in the Lord. An opportunity for them to say, hey, I'm wandering around aimless. I follow and follow the one who gives me life. Your Spirit's going to work in people's hearts and lives today. We just pray that as it does, people will choose to make a response that honors you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.